Uh, again, my name's Matthew Morgan. I apologize to Jamie Hummingberg. Uh, had to uh, get called away and could not uh, serve as a moderator today, so I'm going to fill in here and do my best Jamie impersonation. Um, Russell, if you don't mind, could you get us started by shortly uh, giving a brief introduction of all the, uh, each, each one of you, and then uh, we'll move on to some questions and hopefully have a good dialogue this morning. My name is Russell Witt. I'm the Director of Gaming Compliance for Video Gaming Technology. I'm Daniel McGee. I'm the Gaming Commission Administrator for the Porch Band of Creek Indians. Uh, we operate strictly Class Two gaming. We have three facilities. Hi, I'm Nick Farley. Um, I'm Nick Farley. I'm president of Eclipse Compliance Testing, a regulatory compliance testing laboratory based out of Solon, Ohio. Good morning. I'm Robin Lash. I'm attorney and Eclipse Compliance Testing Manager for Good morning, I'm Mick Romer. I'm the Senior Vice President of the Multimedia Game. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know how familiar you, uh, each of you are with some of our panelists, but we have a really great lineup today. Lots of experience and in industry knowledge in an area that, you know, is not that old, class two. Uh, where we come from and where are we where are we going is a lot of questions um i think we could probably get it started off i'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you guys a, a, a question up here that we kind of hold over from the last administrator uh nigc administration it's uh you know there was a lot of give and take in the last uh, administration under uh, chairman hogan on class two and we developed some class two technical standards that were uh that were promulgated and, and adopted. We developed some class two mix that were promulgated and adopted, but never quite put into operations. And then, you know, there was some work on some classifications. And, and a lot of those classification discussions came down to a, a point on touches, class two. two, two touches, three touches, four touches, five touches. Why, why do you think there's such an interest in the touch of, in, in a class two industry? Uh, and, Nick, if I could start with you from a lab perspective on, on I mean, is, is touches, are you looking at touches in a, in a lab when somebody comes into class two game? Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you, um, about five years ago, the touch issue was, was key. Um, I've been working with the National Indian Gaming Commission to help them prepare advisory opinions on systems that were submitted to our lab. Uh, there was uh, a focus on participation in the game of bingo that that was considered a, a significant element. And the, uh, the, the NIGC's position at that time when we were in discussions about, you know, what should we as a lab look at when we're reviewing these bingo systems, it was, you know, active participation. And they took the position that you had a bet, you had a dog, and you had a claim. That, those were three elements that had to be covered with a bingo system. Um, so at that point, they, they considered you know, three touch to be the standard. So you had to press the button once to bet, once to dob, once to claim. And then discussions got you know further along. Manufacturers were coming in with new concepts, and tribes were you know felt were of the opinion that bingo is bingo is bingo. And you know we're just a neutral party as a test laboratory. So you know we kind of listened to what everybody had to say, and it was reduced down to two touches because really when you think about it, you're you're betting and then you're dobbing and claiming and then who cares what you know as long as you're playing bingo and the game outcome is determined by a bingo card and a bingo ball drop as long as you're doing that whether you press the button once or twice and some try and and uh, right now i think it's all in the tribal gaming regulators hands to make a determination as to what they feel is comfortable and uh, you know of course you could always be challenged uh, at the federal level but uh, we're seeing a lot of one-touch games that are that are doing well uh, we see some some tribes that want to exercise two touch. I think three touch has pretty much gone away. Uh, but that's uh, kind of my two cents on on the touch thing. Okay, Nick, you started out with regulators. How many regulators do I have in the room? How, how many work for a tribal regulatory agency? All right, do you, do you, of those, raise your hand. How many have class two on your floor? Okay, so what what do you guys look at? What you know, who, who's willing to share with me? What do you look at when you come to do a 
uh, game classification for a class two system? What, what are you looking at as opposed to a class three system or how do you make that determination? It, does touches make a difference, Travis? At Cherokee, does that, that make a difference? Excuse me, not so much. Um, no, it's more based on the, the system itself, what they can go, system in the back of house control. Um, Touching is the one or two touch or three touch hasn't really played into that a whole lot. So. So, so you're not looking at touches? The other thing, from a laboratory perspective, is there's not the impeccable standards that's getting to pass. I know going around the country, there's a wide array of opinions on these touches, depending on whether you're talking to a regulator or, or you know, what jurisdiction that regulator is in, whether you're talking to a state. I've heard some different lab opinions on touches. So, so in your jurisdiction, where, where, where do y'all stand on the touch issue? Is, is it an issue? Is it not an issue? I mean, Russell, BGT, I mean, you may be the la largest class two manufacturer out there. I mean, where, where did you guys stand on, on the touch issue? Well, you know, this, this goes back to, to my time when I was um, when I was with BMN and we were working on the class two technical standards. And I'll read what Ken said that, um, you know, when you look in the regulations, there's nothing that states how many times you have to touch or have to interact with the game. Um, and, you know, when, when you go around and talk to different tribes around the country, um, you know, like, like Matt referred to, there's, there's different opinions out there. A lot of people were afraid of the Hogan opinion uh, and about, you know, how it had to be two touch or, or nothing at all. And, uh, you know, agreeing with Nick, it, it really comes down to what's powering your system. You know, it seems like we got hung up on the touches because that was easy for everybody to understand, you know, and, and you look at the Hogan administration and touches define the game. Well, that's not bingo. Bingo is what's powering the game. You know, when you, when you look at two cars and, and they look exactly alike, you know, if I ask you which one's gas, which one's diesel, you wouldn't be able to look at it and tell me which one it is until you open up the hood and see actually what's powering that game or what's powering that car, what's powering that system. That's really what it comes down to. If, it, if it's a bingo-based system and those outcomes are, are being determined by bingo ball draw, be it a, a 90 ball game, 75 ball game, however you want to do it, if, if those infinite outcomes are coming out from the RNG, that's bingo. If I interact with it once, twice, three times, five times, it doesn't really make a difference. It's really what's powering that game. You know, what makes a class two game separate from a class three game? And, and this is what we talk about when we go around to these different commissions and they ask, they ask the question, you know, and, and as Nick stated, you know, we put it back in the hands of the commission. But, you know, if you if you want the information, you know, we're going to give you the information and say nothing in these regs say, you know, how many times you have to touch the game. And, you you know, you it, it really comes down to, to a training and education standpoint, I think. And if you can pass this knowledge over and let the commissions have all this information and weigh their options, you know, that's, that's what we try to do from a manufacturer standpoint. It's just give the information to the tribe and let them make the determination on, on how they want the games to be played on the floor. But you know, there, there's nothing that says I've got to touch it once or twice or three times in, in any documentation that's out there. Christina and Mick, from a manufacturer point of view, uh, along with Russell at VGT, you have Valleys and Multimedia Games here. I mean, is that a, uh, a consideration as you're developing products for the Class two market? The number of touches? Yeah, we absolutely uh, would, would love to see one touch out there. We offer one touch, two touch, and three touch like most manufacturers do. And there is nothing that we know of that says it has to be one or the other. I mean, that really came from really the lack of uh, clear rules. And those clear rules then made uh, tribal gaming authorities and, and uh, manufacturers very wary about how, but how do we fall, how do we stay within the rules without having to litigate these issues? And because of that, then people went up to the extreme with Hogan to three touch waiting you know, minutes to, in between each, down to a one touch or a one two, which was a press the button down for one, release for two, similar to a mouse. But to, the one touch games that we have been able to put in are extremely competitive with class three games. And in many cases, they actually beat the performance of a class three game. And ultimately, that's exactly where we want to be. We want to have a bingo game, electronic uh, gaming device, that allows um, you, tribal gaming to be able to present a game that is just as competitive with Class 3, where you do not have to pay any kind of fees, uh, or taxes, or licenses, or exclusivity fees, uh, so that you have the independence in, in tribal gaming to have viable casinos, and that's really what we're trying to do. And I think it's a it's a pretty impressive time right now that we have such a, a, a good uh, gaming authority in IGC, and people are really trying to work toward these mixed 
we've spent the last five or six months really coming up with a good set of standards and we hope that they get adopted uh, quickly uh, before the change of any kind of administration because it really sets up kind of the future of Native American gaming and make it viable. Because if you can um, put out class two games that are, are just as well as any class three game and can be completely independent of any kind of fees, isn't that exactly what we're trying to get to? That's what we want. And uh, we've proved that that can happen. And it, it really comes down to the decision of does a particular guy, a tri tribal gaming authority, want to adopt a one touch? Or do they want to be more conservative than two touch? Or do they want to be extremely conservative than three touch? And it really falls back on, on to that decision. Christine, do you have any um, input? I mean, again, it's all vendors The, the confusion is good for the country. It's not a confusion of what is in there. And I have heard uh, a quote from uh, Tracy Stevens, the NRC chair, when in March of 2011 with the governor of Alabama, where she describes what is bingo for under the class two standard. And the final paragraph said, the game is won by the first person covering the previously designated not, and then touch the button. So you see a lot of the states looking to increase their revenue on compact and gain. Um, so politically motivated lobbyists who are representing commercial gain and who are on travel gain, but what's the gain? So that in Alabama. And some religiously motivated lobbies who don't want to gain at all. So the tribe and the tribe regulator has to decide how conservative they want to be to prevent outside influences like a state regulator putting an effect in their compact. But there's nothing in the regulations that say how many times you have to press the button. You know, Daniel, you, you, and, you and Robin are up here kind of uh, uh, going to represent our, our tribal regulators, but Christina brings up a good point. Uh, the letter that Chairwoman Stevens wrote, to my knowledge, was the first time a chairman of the NIDC has came out and endorsed electronic class two bingo as, as being a successor to a session bingo and, and meeting the same definitions. Daniel, in, in your jurisdiction, where you're at, where you're only allowed to do class two, you you have a big job in making sure that no class three comes in. How does the touch issue affect you in, in, in Alabama at Fort Creek? The um, we take the stance that the touch issue is really just a bunch of crock, basically. <laughs> the um, it, it all came about with Hogan talking about wanting to make a bright line between class two and class three, and him trying to figure out how to do that. So you start to talk about how many times you touch it and different things. And um, the way I see it is, it's like the guy I was talking about this morning. You know, things evolve. You can't decide that this is how bingo works and this is how it's always going to work. The, um, I mean, if I were to, you know, you know, what's my time? Accountants, you know, use paper and pen. And then along came the calculator, and so they started using a calculator. So that, does that mean they're not accountants anymore? No. Bingo was once upon a time a matter of playing on a card, and now it's, you know, evolved into a machine. But who decides, you know, that the, the, the definition of bingo or the construction of bingo is that you have to use your hand or you have to use, you know, you got to claim it or dive it? I mean, who decides that? The way I look at it is bingo is a system of numbers come out, they match a pattern, if it matches a pattern, you win a prize. You know what I mean? So if you ask my kids, how long should I wait before I yell bingo, they're going to tell you something different than he's going to tell you. So I just think it was someone had to, like you said, decide, you know, these bingo machines came out, they looked like slot machines, and they worked just as well, and, you know, basically the federal government decided that we just can't have that. So we're going to have to decide how to make these worse than those. Because bingo should not be as a money maker tool as well. As, it shouldn't make money as easy as a class three machine does. So that's what a class two bingo. In my opinion, that should be left up to TGRAs. You know what I mean? You say here's bingo, numbers matching up. 
a pattern, pattern with the prize, and let the TGRA or the tribe decide how they want to go about doing it, as long as the basic system works the same way. Now, that's all said in lack of a federal rule, but if that came out, then I guess we'd have to, but from Forks Creek's standpoint, we would definitely oppose the whole touching one, two, or three times and waiting seven seconds. It's just crazy. Robert, you know, I've, I've heard this theory uh, uh, pitch before, especially when we start talking into touches. Well, what, what is a touch? Is a touch the dog? Is a touch putting money in and then picking your denom level and picking how many lines you want to play and then engaging the machine? And I mean, we're, you know, from a, from a legal perspective, because you know, you bring in your lawyer lawyer hat as well as your regulator hat on this one. You know, does that make a difference, or how do how do you look at that at the Miami trial? Well. Um, at the Miami Tribe and going back to the Gaming Commission regulatory side, I agree with Daniel and um, the other comments up here that, well, for our regulatory perspective, that touch doesn't matter. And um, I also agree with the, at the legal end of it, um, I don't, touch does not matter either. In IGRA, there are, IGRA outlines and the federal courts have supported that there are basically three elements to bingo, and that is having your pattern on the, your pattern of the game on the machine, the numbers are drawn and the first player person that covers the winning pattern wins the game. That's bingo. And nothing else is bingo. So all the one touch, two touch, all that that talk is myth, as Joe Blander said in his article. And, and I agree, um, you know, I think truly the Department of Justice is trying to, you know, cause problems for class two gaming. You know, they started with when it plugs in the wall, it's not class two. Um, and NIGC and Phil Hogan fell right in on that. You know, the tribes are making too much money. Class two is too lucrative. Um, there, you know, this whole bright line issue that, that Phil Hogan uh, maintained through uh, his office up there at the, the commission was just a, just a problem for the tribes that didn't need to happen. So I, I agree that, you know, the whole one touch, two touch, three touch, whatever is nothing that we look at at the Miami tribe and I think it's just out there to cause problems for gaming. It is not a part of bingo. You know, I hear this uh, discussion a lot of my regulators out there. Is there, is there a jurisdiction that allows, quote unquote, one touch? I mean, how about two touches, three touches, four touches, five touches? I know you got class two games out there. I know Travis does a Cherokee, and I see one of your commissioners in the back room, and I know you, actually the large majority of your floor is made up of class two at, at right Cherokee. but it's, it's a dead issue i mean it's a new issue for us we don't care simply uh, everyone else said it it's, it's just a non-issue we don't even consider it we consider the bingo pattern um, ball drop server um two players you know at least two players those are the things we look at I mean, it's just not something that that's even on our radar or something like that now it's said they change the laws you know if we start looking at it's some other regulations, but I think it's just simply to muddy the waters. Like everyone said, that's all this is for. Mr. Burris, do you have a different perspective at, at VA office in California and dealing with the with the state and some of your issues out there on, on touch issues? I mean, California is one of the last areas where class two really has not taken off and there seems to be a, a lively discussion on what is class two and what isn't class two. So what, what is your thoughts on, on the touch issue? Well, first of all, let's give California credit because Cabazon decisions came out of that. And that's the first bill about facsimile. So we look at the whole historical aspect of this and where we go to and, and, and uh, we, we, some of this was driven by court decisions, but also let's go back to the Senate Report 555, which said that it's the elements or the characteristics of bingo. Now, what are the characteristics of bingo? Well, they're all over the board. Nobody knows. I mean, everybody's done other reasons for other reasons, whether it was to control the game or manage the game. <laughs> you know, so we got operational perspectives, we got new marketing aspects of it. So, what are the characteristics of bingo? And the ability we create from that. But the problem is, is that we, the experience that we had in the early 90s or the late 90s, is that the court decisions drove, drove some of that, and it drives it today. Now. We can sit here and say we don't it doesn't play a role anymore but we have to be cautious i think because you know congress and its planetary power and wisdom can do whatever the hell it wants to us without us having control over it um, i don't agree with i don't disagree with what they say but it's easy to say 15 years later 
And then we, we finally started winning court cases that uh, multimedia went to bat for uh, back in the early 2000s, which we wouldn't be grateful for. So it's, it's a dilemma, but it's a, I just say, let's be cautious. Let's not be over ambitious towards thinking that it doesn't matter. There isn't, because uh, Nick referred to significant elements. And yeah, you know, the one thing I would say is bet never was a bet. You buy into being though, the bet or whatever happens, that doesn't exist. And that's the reason we made the argument about Dobb and claim, and we settled for that at one point. But it was the ambiguity, and, and again, we, we taught a, an agency that didn't know crap about bingo, much less about gaming. Uh, and not, don't mean that negatively, but we didn't either in Indian country. We didn't know bingo. And someone made the reference about paper bingo made too much money, or I remember the days when we made a shitload of money in paper bingo in this country, in Indian country here in Oklahoma. At Oto, at Call, at, uh, at uh, Hominy. So, and I always made that argument, that's not correct. As, as, the, as, the, as it became more bingo halls, less money was being made. Now we go to electronics, it makes money because there's less. So people come to it. As we get more games, there's less money to be made, but it still makes money. So that argument, those are the elements that we need to put into this, and we need to be cautious about where we go. I'm just worried about the future because this is a great, this is current administration's good and it's said good things, but we don't know what the next administrations down the road will do, and we won't know what Congress will do if they re Remember, bingo is a, game of, is a game of chance. By the mere fact that the statute, by the act of Congress says, it's bingo. So let's let's be cautious with that because Congress and its infinite wisdom can change it by changing that statute. I agree. It's always a worry in our in our industry. And you, and you brought up our current NIGC administration. And one of their tasks that they've taken on is a regulatory review. Uh, Chairwoman Stephen has told uh, Congress that she wants to take a complete regulatory review. And one of the, some of those regulations that have came up uh, and and Mick, you kind of drew attention to it earlier is our class two technical standards that we've that were developed under the last uh, uh, NIPC chairman, Chairman Hogan's administration and implemented. And there's lots of discussion on, on those technical standards. There's a lot of discussions when they came out. There was lots of discussions after they've come out. Uh, at least in my mind, a lot of those questions have been settled at this point. Uh, but there's also a lot of discussion on, you know, it definitely drew a line in the sand. And so there's lots of discussion on where those lines are and is that a correct line. So uh, I'd like to move into a discussion about our class two technical standards, not only how they came about historically, but also you know what they meant for the industry, your feelings on on the class two technical standards, and if those uh, some of those lines may need to change in the future. That is something that you know they have. Uh, Chairwoman Stevens said they will take up is a discussion of all the regulation that includes those technical standards. So uh, Christina, from your perspective on class two technical standards. What have they meant at Valley, as far as your product development and how you've had to uh, maybe uh, mature in some of your class two areas uh, in working with your relationship with the regulator and now the labs and with the manufacturers to make sure that we have products that are meeting those standards? Well, Valley's is a licensed vendor, right? A lot of jurisdictions. So having technical standards that we can submit our product to an ITL and become certified um, is a benefit for us. It makes it less ambiguous. Um, we're challenged less by unrelated jurisdictions. So the minute the tech standards were published the last time around, we went right for full certification. We didn't go with grandfathering, and our system is fully certified. I like it. It gives me rules to follow by. The game guys, not so much. They feel like they have to do a lot of work that maybe the player never sees, no one really cares about, wording on glass. Um, the ITLs we've had long-term relationships with in many jurisdictions, so uh, working with them was easy. Daniel, at, at your place on, on the technical standards, do you feel like it was, it, it definitely had an impact. Was that a good impact, a bad impact? The impact you know you'd like to see change what are your thoughts on the class two technical standards oh uh, from a regular standpoint regulators you know for years we have been lacking in the whole it department that area you know, they, and as a commission is our responsibility to look at a game and say you know yes 
this is class two, this is class three. In the past, all we could do was go play the game and for all practical purposes, see that it did what we thought it was supposed to do. So I like, uh, from a regulatory standpoint, technical standards. Um, the details of the technical standards, I couldn't really speak to because it's simply over my head. You know, but I like the idea that if I can get a letter from a lab that states that they have checked this vendor's machine or his system and it meets all these standards, that gives me peace of mind to say, I feel much better about my decision to say, this is operating correctly in the class two game. So whether the current standards are good or bad, I believe standards need to be in place. So, so there is a need for standards. We want to talk about some of the lines that they've drawn on, on some of those standards, and you can talk about. I know, Christina, you said you went for full certification, sure, you know, right away. There, there were some manufacturers that chose to to grant to pursue a grandfathering line of thought, and there's there are provisions on there, sunset provisions on grandfathering. I know we had a lively discussion on on some of the uh, individually components of those technical standards. Um, Russell from BGT again. I alluded earlier. I think y'all are one of the largest ones. So you know, and I, you, you guys chose to pursue some uh, grandfathering line for some of your products. So you know, what is the technical standards met for you guys at Video Gaming Technology? Well, um, you know, in this in this last round here of, uh, of the, the travel work group, you know, we, we focused mostly on the mix. But um, so towards the end of our uh, last meetings, we we started discussing the uh, the tech standards. And when we were um, in negotiations the first time in developing the tech standards, uh, the, the section for grandfathering, 547.4, um, we were in a meeting, I believe we were in Phoenix, and uh, when we got, you know, drove along at that time as chief of staff and walked over to our meeting and handed us the grandfathering provision. You know, and uh, it, was, it was kind of awkward because every other section, you know, we sat there and, and we debated, we had some lively debates, you know, we. Uh, we had uh, arguments over must or shall, can or will, and you know, I mean, it was, it was a great dialogue, and, and you know, we forged, you know, pretty much every section of that, of, of those standards, and, you know, as, as an industry, with you know, with great minds like Gary and Tracy and, and Mick and Nick and these guys that you know have been doing this for a long time, and you know, were the efforts in the industry. It was, it was great to see the industry put this together. Then we came to the grandfather provision, you know, and it was like knock, 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 here you go, non-negotiable, and it was tough because. If you look at the standards, uh, if you look at every other section, the, the TGRA is the primary regulator. Well, if you look at the grandfathering provision, it's really the NIGC that's the primary regulator of that. And it, it, it's, caused some, it's caused some strife, it's caused some confusion. You know, the NIGC saying, okay, a grandfathered system can only be on the floor for five years. Well, that's the NIGC regulating. That's not the TGRA regulating and saying, well, I want to keep this game on my floor for 10 years, 8 years, 15 years, 20 years. Um, so, so that's caused some issue there. Um, the UL certification uh, has caused some issue. No other set of standards in the industry, uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, GOI, no one actually calls out UL specifically. So having UL certification for class two was, was difficult for manufacturers to take, um, especially for legacy products that's been out in the field. Now, BGT has over 20,000 uh, legacy devices in the field uh, that have been playing, you know, operating uh, you know, under the guidance of the TGRA and are approved by the TGRA. So, so these sections kind of mandated that the, the NIGC kind of take over the primary regulator position, um, you know, and, and, and I, we believe that's been an issue with, with the group uh, moving forward. So there's a few articles on the table to, um, to put that back into the TGRA's hand, allow the grandfathering to be perpetual per TGRA. Let the TGRA decide how long that product can stay out on the floor. Let the TGRA decide what testing standards for um, you know electromagnetic interference and ESD and these type of environmental tests that those games should should adhere to. Um, so so right now I think that's kind of like the biggest issue uh, that we have as an industry from the manufacturer side and the TGRA um, with those regulations as these stand. Mick, you you have a few games that are that are grandfathered, but mostly yours, to my at least to my knowledge, are, are fully certified at this point. Um, what is your feeling on this sunset provision of, of, a, of a class two game? Uh, uh, considering that you know a lot of manufacturers did spend some time and effort and money and resources in becoming fully compliant. There's other manufacturers who chose the grandfathering provisions. You guys kind of have both going on. So what, what is your feeling on the sunset provision that are listed within the uh, technical standards? 
Well, first, speaking a little more broadly, I mean, the whole concept of, of the technical standards and minimum internal controls is really to protect the industry. You know, we, have a, we, we work in a fabulous gaming industry, but we have to be above reproach. We cannot afford to be criticized in any way. So the technical standards are really two purposes. We need to maintain the financial integrity of the business that we're in, and we need to protect the player. So that when a person walks up, or a player walks up to that game, they sit down, they know it's a fair game, they know that it's not gonna electrocute them, or they're not gonna be harmed by it, they're gonna have a very good time, it's gonna perform the way that it should perform. Um, and, and that the accounting process of that game is you know, truly, truly transparent and can, and can be, um, you know, stand up to any kind of scrutiny. You know, we do have some grandfather games, that is an issue, whether you, know, you do it today or you do it in three or four years, you know, that's really, an, I think, an issue that, um, that we, we want to do it as quickly as possible. However, I understand that there's, you know, there's games that were in the field that were put there when the rules were, were different. And I, I think we, you know, we try to make sure that as you transition and you get you know, the games that become fully compliant with whatever the new adopted regs are, you know, uh, that has to be done in a way that doesn't harm anybody. It doesn't harm the tribes or the casinos or the manufacturers. But at the same time, it protects <coughs> the integrity and the players that are playing those games. So Daniel made a point earlier about, I'm oh, sorry, I, I hate to stamp my phone, it kills me not to use my hands. Uh, but uh, Daniel made a point earlier about technical standards for a lot of regulatory bodies is, you know, up here. You know, we rely upon Nick, we rely upon BMN, we rely upon GLI to come with that testing standard. <coughs> Thank you. Um, but you know, one of the things I find ironic is, is we talked about technology and one of the first things that were on there was you got to put a sticker on the box. That was the technology standard. So, you know, from, from you guys there, you know, te technology-wise, uh, technical standard-wise, you know, what's giving you heartburn with the class two technical standards? You know, you have a lot of people up here that participate in the drafting, that participated in a lot of the discussions, but at, back at home, you know, where, where are your problems coming from on, on a class two technical standards? Or do they not exist anymore? Have, has it been pretty much settled? Um, and if it is, tell me how you did it, because it's not settled in my place. Um, I, the pending question I have right now is, there are several class two uh, products that were there pre-existing the technology standards that went to court, and a court had found them to be a class two games. Some of those games don't meet the te technical standards. What do I do with those games? What would you do with those games? I have a statute, or I'm sorry, a case law that says, yes, those are class two games. But now I have an NIGC uh, regulation that says, no, they're not a class two game. Who has that authority? Is it the NIGC? Is it a court? Is it your tribal regulatory body? Who, who, who gets to make that decision? That's kind of the look I gave most people too when they ask me that question. Uh, this is one of those things where I ask people, I like to be a close set. Remember that, Trace? You taught me that a long time ago. Grace Grace said, you know what, being a close second is nothing wrong with that. Sometimes you don't want to be the first one. There's a lot to be said for that, you know. So, so what, would, what would you do with that? I, I saw everybody raise their hand, but though there was a regulator out there. I know regulators always have opinions. <laughs> Daniel, that's one of the things I love about you, buddy, is you always got opinions. <laughs> what you do with that? <laughs> well, I, the, um, I don't think... When the technical, when it comes down to the technical standards and the court decision, are kind of, I look at them as two different monsters. The um, the technical standards, I don't so much as being the definition of class two, so much as I could call it class two, and for all practical purposes, it is class two. The technical standards go into all these other little things about the machine, like you said, does it electrocute you? Does it, you know, does it have this the random number generator truly randomly generating? I mean, whatever it does. So, I mean, the I legal definition yeah. randomly generate. Yes. The um. So the way I I see it is I can um decide that the game was a class two game, but as far as technically does it work? The insides of it were fair. It's different. And that's what I rely on the technical standards. So just because a court decision decided it was class two, they decided the same way I did. 
they looked at it and they played it and they looked at the screen and it seemed to work like a class two machine, but someone has to dig inside the machine and see that what appears to be a randomly generated set of numbers truly is. And that's what I rely on standard to do for me as a trial. So Danny, you're, you're telling me you had to do something I'm telling you, no, I'm telling you that the people that are saying that the court said it was class two still didn't meet the test. That's what you're telling me. Because of how do you know, like I said, how do you know that the random, you know, the numbers falling out are truly randomly generated? The court decision, I don't, I don't think they looked at all that. So <coughs> your opinion would be that a, I mean, I'm sure you judged it. Agency by regulation can change case law. I'm telling you that. <laughs> no, just ask. Yeah, just ask. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that you could say, it, you could agree with them that yes, it's class two. But as a regulatory body, there's certain things you want to know about. You know, in addition to the fact that it's class two. And the way you're going to get that is by testing the certain standards that are technical standards. Whether the technical standards that are out now are going to come out in the future, you're going to have to test those to find more than is it class two. You need to know more than just that one question. So the court decided, yes, it's class two, but there's a whole lot of other aspects of the technical standards that are just not about class two. That you need to know as a regular So are you telling me I could put that game on the floor and tested against the technical standards does it matter if i've already classified it that's my job as a regulator to classify it yeah. so I've, I've classified it as class two so does it matter then from a uh, national gaming commission perspective whether it meets the technical standards i know we're talking about you know to me what you're telling me is integrity issues you know the, the, does the integrity of the game hold up so but if i've already classified it as a class two is it just my issue that I want that product on the floor? Or is that product eligible to be played? So just because it may not be my standards at Chickasaw, it may be Travis's standards at Cherokee. It may, it may not. Is that our individual choices as, as a regulatory body? Well, I, I, I was just going to add that some of the discussion that was kind of previously, I know you're going down the path, and I don't want to change the course, but I, there's, there's a little ambiguity out there. I don't know what the right word is. I'm going to use the word ambiguity, but there's, there's this with, with the grandfather provision, it was a it was a five year sunset, but it was just to get submitted into a lab by March 10th, 2009. And I can tell you from my own experience, we had quite an influx of, of submissions in the lab between January and March 10th, 2009. Everybody seemed to come out of the woodwork with a class of the bingo system to get their receipt letter from the lab saying that it was in prior to the deadline. I can tell you right now that only a handful have pursued testing from that, and all the receipt letters have the issue. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but there's a lot of class two systems that may be in operation or may not be in operation, I'm not sure, that have a submission receipt from a testing laboratory saying that they submitted it prior to the deadline, that haven't, you know, that have left the system in the lab and haven't paid their bill for the receipt letter. Um, so, you know, there's no progress going on with, with those systems. Now, I think a lot of them have gone by the wayside and gone belly up or have decided to pull out. I think that it's been a separation of men versus the boys in some regards for class two. But um, you know there 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 is a lot there and, and to talk about the grandfather provision and what's what's happened, you know, since March 10, 2009 when submission had the end of the lab. So you're seeing a lot of companies, some of here, some of which are here at this table, that are proactively getting their stuff submitted and tested and Needing compliance, full compliance, grandfather compliance if they, if they met the deadline. But there are some out there that just got into the lab to get that letter that said it was in the lab and, and it hasn't been pursued. I don't know if they ever have to be pursued. They just kind of let that five years come and go. Uh, and it's been kind of interesting to see that. And I just want to mention that because that may be something that a lot of people don't realize is that just because they submitted it to the lab prior to the deadline didn't mean that they actually went through and passed muster. It may be something that you as uh, of the tribal gaming regulators that are in the room might want to look at if you think that you have uh, a system that you had a receipt letter on don't have a report on. You might want to take a look at it. I don't know if it makes a difference or not because the technical standards will say it has to be submitted 
and then it could stay in operation for five years. Um, but there's that ambiguity of whether it actually has to be tested within that five year period or it just has to be submitted. Some more questions, not a lot of answers. Uh, yeah. I'm good at that. <laughs> you know, you're, you remind me of an attorney that works in wheels. <laughs> One, one case if they can drill up we still have the topic of internet gaming to, to go to and there's I, I know we have lots of discussion about internet class two class three card games skill games what does it mean how do you test where is it legal where is it not but i'd like to take about a five minute break before we get into the internet gaming discussion let everybody stretch your legs for a second as we come to talk more about internet gaming and where where were we going with internet gaming um, I'm going to try to really get some audience participation in here. San Manuel probably has a question that needs to be asked on this section. <laughs> um, but, you know, what, what do you, I'll start with, you know, and I'll just open it up. Whether there's audience uh, participation questions, panelists, you know, uh, internet gaming. What kind of impact do you feel internet gaming will, will have on, the, on class two? Um, internet gaming in class two is going to be an, inter an interesting study, that's for sure. I, I think what you're what you're going to see is class two is going to have to adopt to be played on the internet if internet gaming is going to become legal and regulated. And I think that the first movers for class two on the internet are, are going to be in the band. Now, I think that's going to be a contentious argument as to whether class two can be conducted on the internet. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that may have to be decided by the courts, but I'm just an engineer, so don't quote me on that. Um, but I, I think from what I'm seeing with internet regulation that's being proposed and laws that are being proposed, internet poker is probably going to be the first move, as, as Matt mentioned. It seems to be the path of least resistance. If internet gaming is going to, going to exist, it will be in the form of poker. Most likely, multiple players playing against each other or a non house bank pool, if you will, uh, lends itself to class two because uh, you know, that's one of the elements of class two. I mean, bingo, where bingo's played, you have non house bank card games and things like that, and tip cards and punch boards and things like that. But uh, there are some limitations on whether that's allowed in the state. So I'm kind of rambling here uh, because. You know, my crystal ball is kind of cloudy right now. Uh, <laughs> and, and really, we're kind of trying to predict the future as to, you know, what is this, what, what, what will class two gaming look like in the day of internet gaming? And uh, I think that you are going to see a move to bring class two into the internet realm. I think that's a logical progression. And with tribal sovereignty, I, I think it's almost a necessity. So uh, I think that that's going to be a reality. You know, poker may be the, open, the door that opens up internet gaming here in the United States, but I think Class 2 is going to be right behind that. I think the, the statement was a, a, close to se a close second place. Um, they won't be the first, but they'll be a close second. And I, I think you're going to see um, you know, some challenges with Class 2, whether that can be done or not. Tribal sovereignty is always going to be brought into, into the foray as to you know, what can and can't be done in the realm of Class 2. But uh, that's kind of my way to the ball look on things. We'll see what happens in the future. Um, I would just like to address a few comments that, well, a few concerns that I have with regard to internet gaming. Um, I think that its effect with tribes um, and our land-based gaming, uh, that there's going to be an impact if the tribes don't join in, if they do not participate in the in internet gaming. Um, I think right now, as an illegal uh, occurrence that's taking place, the gaming in the United States is a $6 billion gaming. It's taking place illegally, internet gaming. And um, you know when we, you have your tribal governments and $26 billion in Indian gaming for legal gaming, land-based gaming, um, if you look at the demographics of the people that come to the casinos, you have um, primarily they're 45 years and older that are going to the land-based gaming casinos. And 70% of adults have a computer at home. Um, we have a huge younger population that are, are um, internet savvy and, that, and 
and they'll be moving into the older ages and getting into the gaming. So, you know, basically what I'm trying to say is there's going to be a big, huge market for internet gaming, and if it becomes legal, there's going to be issues with the tribes trying to compete with the big name, Harrah's, MGM, and that kind of thing. So the tribes have a whole lot of concerns to look at. And as a regulator, there are just numerous concerns. How are you going to know that the, partic the participant in internet gaming is of legal age and haven't taken their parents' credit card and are using the credit card? I mean, everything that we regulate now as regulators, we can see and touch. Um, so there's going to be a whole lot of change for tribes. They're going to have to really step it up to protect the website security, to protect the funds of the patrons, um, and uh, it's going to be a, a whole new world for gaming for the tribes. And I think from the comments that I've heard, most uh, tribes and regulators, they're, they're wondering how we're going to regulate, and they're just basically um, concerns on competition in the marketplace with the big gaming manufacturers. What I see is um, a big issue coming up with the tribes start getting into or trying to get into internet gaming is an opportunity for corporate type companies to um, figure out how to stop any dangerous tracks, so to speak. I mean, right now we have all these issues of infrared game that has to be on trust land. Okay, so the first issue is if you're internet gaming, um, what does that mean? That means if I'm going to get on the internet to do gaming in an Indian Indian tribe sponsoring, do I have to be on trust land when I'm playing that game? Or does the server just have to be on trust land? Um, so there's one big issue I see coming up as a tool to say Indian gaming can't really get too deep into internet gaming because of that issue, so they'll use that. The, um, so I, I just worry that when I do believe it's coming. You know, I don't think the seniors say it's going to happen. I think it is coming. But I think the tribe is going to be a much bigger legal battle with the issue of how do we um, compete with big dogs or corporate type gaming industry when they're um, playing good as some speaker dollars. You know, I think it's going to be a perfect opportunity for legislators and other people to say, oh, here's a way we can finally rein in these Indian tribes that are just making so much money. That's my opinion. From a manufacturer's point of view, internet gaming, any thoughts, especially on how it's impacting class two? Uh, I, I have a lot of thoughts on <laughs> internet gaming. I mean, if you look at the essence of class two gaming, it, it is a network game. Central is permanent, it draws outcomes for whether you use a cloud, or you use the T1 line, or whatever that is. That's that's just technology giving you the outcome. So, in the simplest form, we're already doing that. It has done it you know, since the beginning uh, of class two. The, to me, it feels like that the uh, the move to try to legalize internet poker is being driven by Caesar's Entertainment and some people who have vested interest in franchises that can capitalize on the poker market. I don't. Personally, I don't know whether it's a, a good thing or a bad thing. I think we have <clears throat> some serious issues with underage gambling and the ability to try to uh, control that and, pr and protect our youth from, from that. Um, but the poker aspect of class two is a little more difficult just by the nature of the random draw and how that's done. Um, and we've, we've got a couple of ideas about how to do it, but it, that is really kind of a class three uh, skill based game. The bigger picture is what's going to happen with um, more traditional slots, real, live uh, real video slots, or even some of the uh, uh, the new you know, skill based kind of game. It, it, the things that John Akers were talking about today, uh, that is really thin client gaming, which whether it's class two or class three, having a server in a cloud, thin client, or with gaming terminal in client on casino floor. That to me that's where it's going. It's not so much intranet, because I have so many issues, social issues with it, but intranet being able to, to deliver uh, in client content into a casino floor that is controlled. I, I think uh, class two actually has some huge opportunities and maybe even some real advantages how the price first technology works. Uh, I, I think there's a big future there. But it, Anybody play Angry Bird? 
Yeah, I mean, so <laughs> you, you, that's, if we think about where our intranet gaming is going, our intranet gaming, it is, it's not about uh, you know, meltdown or hot shots or whatever it is. It's about angry birds. It's about you know, plants and zombies. It's about how do we the jewel, how do we make some of these very interesting games that people are already playing on the internet into more entertaining gambling games and social games? Because uh, if you compare uh, what happened in the video or movie business, where you have these movie theaters and suddenly these, you know, these uh, VCRs and things were coming out and blockbusters, oh, the movie theaters are just going to be dust and they, they, can't, they can't survive. When actually that's not what happened. It just created a complete greater demand in some ways for movies and movie content. I think uh, we can't forget that gambling, uh, what we produce, is a social medium. It is a community. People want to be together. They want to come out. The experience of being in a casino, of sitting and playing with um, your friend, uh, having a cocktail or going to a buffet, all of that is that social experience. We are social animals. And it's not just about being in, in your living room or um, pulled up in the bedroom with the lights off and playing um, some of these games. Um, but so that, I, I do believe that internet gaming and internet gaming is coming. I think internet will come first. And I think you'll see uh, wider, you know, kind of wider delivery of that in tribal gaming casinos first. Uh, and I think uh, you know, tribal casinos will lead the way, uh, but I don't think it's going to happen next year or the year after. Where, where is the game played at? Is it at the server or is it at the terminal? I, I have this question pitched to me a lot. Uh, I'll tell you, some days when, when a gaming lab calls me and you, you're scratching your head, you know, I'm asking, can, can't you give me a softball, an easy one? You know, what, what is the true element? That's a question I've got here lately from a lot of lab places. Where is that game played at? Is it the server or is it the terminal? Just by show of hands. In the audience, uh, class two game, where's it played? Is it server? Who thinks server? Everything's at the server. Okay, who, who thinks it's at the terminal? Uh, who, who thinks maybe it's at both? Yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, a lot of that, that's, that's the question, because is the internet, is it a communication device? As Mick may have brought is it a communication device only? Are you communicating? Because if it's just a communication device, and the game's played at the server, where, where are the limits of where you can play that at? That's the discussion I think that, that needs to happen a lot on internet internet gaming of, of where we're going. Um, uh, there's, a, there's an aspect of discussion, I don't know if you want to take this up on, you know, what Robin brought up on, on the impact of what they call bricks and mortar facility. Is that going to have an impact? I see Stan back there where we go. I thought I saw Stan back there where we go. North Dakota, Stan, is that right? Facilities in, in North Dakota, if internet gaming came, I hear this a lot. I don't see anybody else with North Dakota that that's around on that. <laughs> if, if internet gaming came, oh, sorry, bro. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> what is what is what kind of impact does internet gaming would have on the bricks and mortar facilities in North Dakota? Good, bad? Is it up for discussion right now? I don't know. I don't know if discussion up there or not. But I'm south there, so. <laughs> but it could have, it, it, you know, that's the question you have to be asked. You could have, you know, could have no uh, I'll I can't imagine um, not having some kind of control of A on a computer. I mean, it'd be, if you can actually drink alcohol on a computer, it'd be like saying you get complete outside, uh, access to get whatever you want on this computer. We have to be able to control the age requirement of the computer. And I've heard all kinds of visual recognition, biometrics, whatever it is. It, it, I don't, I'm not saying, tell me how that's possible, how we can provide that. If, if I can tell Mick's comment there and put a little sales pitch into the uh, regulating the internet uh, session that's going to come up later, I'll, I'll do this. Um, then we're going to touch on some of this stuff. Could, 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 could you just finish my point? That's why I think brick and mortar is essential. I think if you call it internet or intranet, it needs to come back to a brick and mortar location so that you can verify age of I Just one thing that makes too is that you know, as a manufacturer, you know, 
you know, BGT, I'm sure, and other media, we're all looking at um, different different avenues to, you know, to, to bring game content. You know, one of the one of the things you're hearing now too is that because internet gaming is illegal in the U.S., you know, you'll see manufacturers looking to to get some type of gameplay out there. You know, like an Angry Birds type thing, where you can maybe uh, win points or things like that. Where those points can then be transferred back over to a casino, uh, and that goes back to Nick's point of, uh, you know, I don't think, uh, you know, in this movie theater point, you know, just because we have blockbuster these things, the movie theaters go away. It's another thing to enhance that experience, you know. So you go and you sit maybe at work online, and you get a bunch of points, and then you come to the casino that night and you turn those points into something—a a, free night stay, a buffet, a dinner. But you know, and you're and you're uh, you know you're, you're, you're um, texting and you're you know, Facebooking your friends or Twitter saying, hey, you know, we're all, we're all going to you know to Casusa Hard Rock tonight. You know, be there at eight. You know, it, it's going to be that whole part of the social experience. The casino will play a part in that. But it's, I think it's the casinos and the manufacturers that tie all those social medias together that will be the ones that will be able to lead the industry. And if it does ever go live and we do get, you know, you know, we, it does become legal, those manufacturers that can flip the switch to go from, okay, I'm playing for points, now I'm playing for money, or money and points or some combination, those ones will be the ones that I think that are going to be leading, you know, leading the joint up there. Mr. Burris? I'm gonna do a disclaimer off the bat. I'm gonna do a disclaimer off the bat, and this is my personal opinion. And I'm gonna be a little negative here. Uh, we got a lot of good things to no, talk about. Either. And I just re recently, uh, uh, California just went through hearings through the Senate Committee, the GO Committee, uh, through March and April, and you know, there were there were seven of them, I attended four of them, and had great concern. But here's why I look at it, my concern for Indian country. First of all, we separate internet and interstate. And where did it go? The real question that comes is, uh, I'll leave the internet part one on my first and I'll go to interstate. My concern to that would be is who gets to do that and who and how does it do it? At some point, states are going to get smart and figure out because this argument is going to go on for another two years. But why not give it to my lottery? Why not let my lottery run it because I'm getting more of the revenue because that's what's going to be the benefit to them because it's the impact. It's the safety of your property. Is it going to, you know, I've heard numbers from 2%, 4%, 6% to your brick and mortar? Maybe, maybe not. But in a down economy, can you get, can you absorb a 2%? In an upswing, you can absorb a 2%, but can you in a downswing? Good question. And that's to a, a brick and mortar facility's concern should be. The other part becomes is, if you <coughs> let this interstate go through like Iowa, California, others have been talking about attempting to do, my concern would be is, why not the lottery? And what do you know? You're gonna have, you're gonna have terminals set up at every gas station to do it five or six, here we go again. People that don't come to your brick and mortar are gonna jump on the internet, and that's what we're gonna call it, at, a, at an internet cafe, at a restaurant, at all these other things. So there is a potential impact of this. Just like Russ said about the the big boys, anyone that can draw you to it. Maybe I've got a casino there in California. We, also, we can offer uh, eateries and all that to get that. That expands internationally too, or uh, nationwide. Uh, it, there's a lot of, what is, and there's a lot of fearful things because it's expensive to do. It's even more since you're, if you're just, how accurate is it? Well, we never know how accurate the internet is. You're gonna have to keep the Chinese from hacking into it. If you're good, you're gonna spend a fortune on doing it and can try, and, and I'm speaking, what I think concern for tribes is, can we really afford to do it? Or do we, are we willing to spend the millions and millions of dollars to do it? Or can we even compete with those that already have it that have proven records? You got to give it to uh, Europe. There's a lot of good ones over there. They've proven it. They've been working this thing for ten years, and they they haven't perfected it, but they've got it down pretty well. Uh, so that's good. My other concern is: so do the tribes jump on the interstate aspect of it, or do we worry about Kyle's bill? And uh, I forgot the other one that introduced the bill, the the congressman from California about internet. You know. The original position on that was, is, here's my concern, as the bill stands now, uh, who are we gonna have run it? Did anybody take a look at it? Treasury Department. Treasury Department. And my, from my perspective, from a tribal perspective, my deal is, you get the Treasury Department to do it, they're gonna tax it. And uh, my fear is, if the tribes jump on that bandwagon, and they're gonna say, we're gonna start taxing this because the federal government needs a deficit, needs to take care of that. 
we want to tax it up front. The next thing happens is, look, you collect our tax on the internet for us. Why not collect it in your facility? There's a lot of good questions and a lot of dangers to something of this effect. And things that need to be thoroughly thought out as what the impact is to brick and mortar, whether you're commercial or tribal, especially tribal. So those would be my concerns. I mean, there's a lot more and, and eventually states that have deficits are gonna look at that. Why not their lotteries be the carrier of that? Or why not something that they possess and in maximizing the greater amount of the impact? And you know, who else will better stay off any criticism than the state? That's my two cents on it. And I worry about the federal because one, you can't compete. Uh, let's be real. IPT's done a hell of a job. They spent tens of millions of dollars to get it ready. Harris, that whole claim, how many, they've got 80 million people's emails they can reach out to. Your property has two or 300,000, some have more, some don't. You jump into a consortium, you get a piece of it, that's probably the way to go. But is it, a, is it enough to offset or impact who you're competing with? All of a sudden you start competing with the consortium against your player. And do you win or lose? Who knows? Those are good questions to that. So that's my two cents on it. And my disclaimer, that's my personal opinion. You know my rights. Uh, one of the hats I, I put on sometimes, I sit on the executive committee of the National Gaming Association. We've had a lively discussion over the past year on internet gaming and actually last year at our mid-year uh, up, up at the Shock Peaks, we, we came up with a NIDA resolution on what we feel like characteristics of any internet bill should, should have in it uh, with, when you're talking about any gaming. But to further that conversation and, and something we're actually having our, our board meeting tomorrow in Minneapolis, uh, but uh, we, we've uh, created best on this last April's convention an internet subcommittee made up of executive members uh, only for the voting purposes, and then we're going to open it up to the public as non-voting members, and it's up for uh, this subcommittee to, we've been tasked and charged by our chairman, Arnie Stevens, to come back with a uh, proposal to him by mid-year, which will probably be in October this year, I think, on internet gaming and how Indian country feels. And uh, if, if you have input, if you have questions, I would welcome you to that. We're just this week kind of setting out the parameters of what that subcommittee will look like and what subjects we will cover and trying to narrow the, the conversation down. But, uh, you know, from what I'm hearing from you guys is we have lots of questions, lots of concerns, but not a lot of answers on, you know, internet gaming. Uh, and, you know, NIGA's taking the, the step out there to, to try to, to get everybody's comments and concerns and, and kind of put a loop around them and, and deliver that out to Indian country uh, for discussion point. So if you want to be involved with that, please uh, keep uh, keep aware of NIGA's website. We will be sending out notices on when those uh, meetings will, will take place. Uh, it's kind of my two cents on, on internet pitching, but you know, um, not, not, to, not to wind the discussion down at all, but you know, Tracy, you brought up a lot of good question, questions on, on what are we looking at uh, you know, you got different states moving forward. Washington, D.C. had a proposal. New, Jer New Jersey had a proposal. Uh, Kentucky was looking at it for a little while. You have all the discussion in California. Um, you know, internet gaming is, is a big question mark to me, at least, out there. Uh, does anybody have any final points on internet gaming or any uh, questions on internet gaming before we wrap up this, this portion of the discussion? I know, Ken, you got to have something. I've got a question. Uh, just a couple of things. I mean, Nick and I have uh, our session at three, uh, regulating internet gaming, and, and you know, putting together that, putting together that presentation, you know, there's so many different aspects to this topic. It's so broad. There's so many different moving parts. And for me, you know, and by the way, Washington D.C. did pass internet gaming, so uh, it, it passed by virtue of. Congress not doing anything <laughs> about them passing. Uh, it's kind of a it was a hands-off passing of internet gaming in DC, and they've become the first uh, territory or jurisdiction in the United States to have internet gaming. Um, but for me, I, I see real flaws in in the uh, poker aspect of internet gaming. Right. Um, Nick and I had a discussion on Sunday about this, and it's really it's just for me it's. You know, you go you go into a physical poker room in a casino. You know, you have surveillance, you have you know hit bosses, you have there's security in place. You know, you get a fair shake. I mean, there is isolated occurrences of cheating, but you wander into a, an internet poker room and you're the fifth person into the room. 
the other four people could all be on working together against you and uh, counting cards. And there's really no defense against that on the internet. And that's been a problem that uh, that's been going on at, on these poker sites around the world. And I don't know why that's the first step. These jurisdictions like New Jersey and DC and California is looking to do poker. Um, why that is the logical first step? Because to me, that's the hardest one to regulate from a player's perspective. And it could it could become a really sour point for players in America when they figure out that there's a lot of collusion and and, and uh, you know improper games going on on the internet. For me, that's an opportunity for class two. It's an opportunity for for tribes to get for and for manufacturers to get a class two product that plays bingo online. And the player, when they go into that room, they know they're playing bingo against other players for bingo, and there's no way you can cheat that. At least, uh, I mean, it, like Nick said, it's it's an uh, intranet, it's a uh, it's interactive gaming, it's centrally determined. You know, get that, go that way. That's an opportunity for tribes, I think, to really capitalize on their sovereignty, on the fact that they don't have to necessarily answer to a lot of the things that states do uh, on an isolated basis. So. That's my point about that. Okay. I had a question back here as well. Yeah, I had a question. <clears throat> yeah, you'd asked earlier. Uh, you had asked earlier whether or not uh, playing over the internet where the game actually takes place. And so my question to you, or to the panel, is right now, if you have a game machine on trust land, and the player steps off of trust land and reaches across and plays, is that legal? Or does the player right now have to be on trust land? Does that, that's right. you know, I, I do have a facility where, where my trust land, where the facility actually goes over the trust land and, and did not even get into your discussion, I have made sure that the player, the chair, the game, everything with with about two foot to spare because uh, I, I didn't want to get into that, that discussion so I, I, I kind of took that approach to it you know uh, it may be a conservative approach but I, I forced the the, the uh, operation to, to move the banking machines over about four or five feet so I didn't have to get into that discussion because again uh, Tracy close second I, I didn't know anybody else that answered that question so I didn't want to I don't know uh, Daniel Robin I mean I would agree. I don't think it would be legal for them to reach uh, from a non-trust land location across to play the game. I think that Matt is safe in saying the best um, best defense is to keep everything on trust land. And, and the precedent is now set for D.C. where there's an intranet within Washington, D.C. New Jersey is going to be an intranet within New Jersey, California, same thing. So for a tribe, if they're going to go at it without state in it, interaction and it's probably gonna have to be on trust now I will preface my answer before I get to you you, you asked it I'm answering as a regulator I'm, I'm sure my operations guys would have a totally different answer to that but as the as the regulator that's that would be my answer Gary well just to um, just to point out that just to point out you know, the tribes have already done an intranet multi-state, not on just trust land. You know, when, when maybe Mania, or maybe Bingo, mm -hmm. which is the paper game, satellite game, was played, that game was played in Washington, D.C. with three churches, Catholic churches, of course, and the tribes amongst the 40 or 50 tribal occasions that were conducting, conducting the paper game. And you could certainly do the Mega Mania game on the same kind of basis. So that, that has happened. And it's, uh, it happened to be a federal jurisdiction. That would probably be the argument with yeah. D.C. But they permitted it. So I would imagine if the state permitted it, we do the same thing. Any other point of views for the, for the question that you had? Do we have any other questions out there? Uh, not only on the internet, but technical standards or uh, one touch or anything else that has to deal with class two gaming that's just weighing on your mind that you feel like you need an answer to? I've kind of seen faces today that look like you want to ask a question and thought thought better of it. So 
you know, feel, feel free. I, I promise. Uh, I, I, I have a, a bad habit of telling my staff, talk to me like I'm a first grader, because sometimes I just don't understand. So um, I, I'm, I'm the first one to kind of, somebody look at me and go, really, that's your question? Sorry, yeah, that's my question. Let's start at that level. So is there any other questions that, that we have for our panelists today? Hope we don't have any other questions. Panelists, thank you for your time. I appreciate it.